have come full circle. The end of the year. The the final level of EDH takes. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. It's the end of the year. Um, we're back. I'm Spencer Cook. And I'm Elijah Samuelson. And like I said, full circle. We are, in this episode, hoping to revisit and reevaluate the color combination of red and white and Commander and how things have changed this year. Yeah, so our first episode came out on January 1st of 2021, and this was an episode tackling um, the Boros color combination because we just we thought that opinions are out there weren't really correct. It wasn't being represented well enough, um, and we're big Boros boys in general. And, you know, I, I think you, you can't say that it hasn't been a good year for Boros, right, Eli? Yeah, and at the time we recorded our first episode, the the spark for that episode and we we titled it mass land destruction is not the answer because i used to lurk on reddit maybe a little bit too much and i've I've since drawn pushed that back a little bit but i would go on there and every three months or so it was just amazing you would see this cycle of people talking about white decks or boros decks and being like man this really isn't working i'm starting to think that that we should just social contract be damned. We're going to play mass land destruction, and that's going to fix all our problems. I've cracked the code. This is how you beat green players. <laughs> yeah, and and sometimes you would get people pushing back against that, but these these threads would always be like massively upvoted, and there'd be lots of comments. And I think after like the the fifth or sixth one, eventually people started to be like, "Hey, mods, you should just like remove these posts because it's the same thing every over time, over and over again." Yeah, but. Yeah, we we did that episode talking about all of the awesome value things that you can do in Boros and how you can really just play the game without mass land destruction. Yeah, that that whole episode was kind of like a a Boros um like a lecture, honestly. Like it was going over everything like Boros, win conditions, ramp draw, game plans, yeah. finishers, it was everything. And we're not going to redo that whole episode here, but we've got a lot that come out this year, and we hope to maybe go over some new things, as well as talk about some community perceptions that we think are a bit weird. Yeah, because when we did our episode at the start of this year, we were of the opinion Boros decks are actually very good. Mm -hmm. Probably equal with other color, color combinations, in my opinion. And this year... Like you said earlier, it's been a really good year for Boros. Yeah, and if you didn't think that Boros was... You know, if you, if you, if you don't want to jump all the way over to Boros equal with other color combinations last year, I think at this point you have to admit that that seems to be the case now. If, if you don't want to, you know, think that originally. Or it's at least close. Yeah, sure. If, if, if you know, your views differ a little bit, that's fine. But it's not this, this, uh, this steep cliff when you get to Boros compared to the other... You know, nine color combinations. Yeah, so we're going to start off, we're going to tackle the the cards that have been released and, and then move into kind of community perception and then talk about some, uh, like, maybe our, our top cards at the end of this episode. Yeah. So to start off, uh, I put section one, an embarrassment of riches, because there's been a lot of sets this year. I, that's been a common thing people talk about, oh, product overload and... yeah. A lot of cards, but that means a lot of good Boros cards. Yeah, so I, I, I looked, and this, this number might be off by five or six cards, but the amount of Boros color Boros color identity cards that we got, that is to say white and red cards, that we got in 2021 is around like 600-something. What was it, Eli? Do you remember? Five, so like 580. 580 cards. And I went through all of those cards and categorized them as you know, commander playable or not, and maybe a little bit generously, but I got about 180 cards, and if you want to, you know, be a little bit more, a little bit more, you know, um, fair, I would say at least 100 of the cards printed this year in those color combinations are, like, actually, like, good cards. Maybe the other 80 are fringe. There's a lot. I was trying to, we, we made a list of cards, and we're not just going to list card names, but I put a, a bunch of reference if we forgot a card name of something we want to talk about, and it was it was hard to uh, make the cut because I didn't want to have a a show note that was uh, like ten pages long. Yeah, and and just one other thing to uh, quickly mention is I I think the biggest case for how many just how many good Boros cards we got this year 
is that I, I, I as the kind of a thought of ex- a thought experiment, I built a deck of only new cards we got this year, um, you know, Boros cards. And it's a functioning deck. I mean, it's I haven't built it in paper, but I've got the list up, and I'll probably throw it on screen and show it. And when you look through the list, you're like, yeah, all these cards seem good. So I think it's a good deck, personally. At, at, at the very least, um, at the very least, precon level, and at the very best, you know, good good precon or, or upgraded. It's probably on, the, on upgraded on like on like some of the better precons level, right? I think one thing we mentioned on the first Boros episode was the idea of just just don't play bad cards. And this uh, this deck that you made, I don't think it's playing bad cards. It's yeah. just a bunch of mediocre to very good cards yeah so um you can i'll put the link in the description if you want to look at it um also it's not including uh the four most expensive cards that came out this year that are ragavan solitude fury and goldspan dragon just because i didn't want to put them in but those are all good cards that probably make the list um but you know that's neither here nor there let's let's start maybe talking about um you know where we like you said you like the embarrassment of riches one thing I wanted to mention was before this year, there were certain things that that Boros didn't have that I really wanted to have, and I and that I've wanted for a long time. Uh, and I wanted to list off this kind of wish list of cards, and then we'll see as we go through this uh, how many of these were met mm-hmm. this year. And those things include a, a two mana rummager in red. That's something I always thought we had Merfolk looter. We should have like a like a goblin rummager that's not three mana. Yeah. And then, like, a red Archaeomancer, something to recur spells in, in the color of red, like, efficiently, though. Because mm-hmm. I think there was Anarchist or something way back in the day that got back sorceries. And then, uh, cantripping white creatures, like, you had a Wall of Omens, and we had our, the the core you like, that was oh, yeah. last year. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, also, the, the new one, I mean, I guess we won't talk about them all, but yeah, we'll wait to say what they are. And then more board white protection, specifically stuff that protects from Rift, because people always, they, they talk about cards that give indestructible all the time, as like, oh, this card's really good, or like, this should be played more. <laughs> it's like, that, I don't really think that uh, that does what you think it's going to do. Psych Rift does, you know, does does work against indestructibility, yeah. Or even just other kinds of board wipes, like... Uh, Terminus, or something that, like, a negative X, negative X, like a Toxic Deluge. Yeah, Toxic Deluge, that's what I was trying to think of. Yeah. A very prevalent in the format black sun zenith whatever you know all those things and then uh more free interaction like in red and white like you get free counter spells for days in blue but you don't get a lot of free spot removal or other kinds of interaction in yeah Boris. and and you know black has free uh you know like cards like snuff out deadly rollick and green has like uh force of uh vir- not virtue what force of green one that destroys artifacts and enchantments yeah um and you know, all all of these things, we got all of them. Yep. Yeah, spoiler alert. We're going to go through the, the list of things from this year, and uh, those were all fulfilled in some way. And that's uh, that's literally every every ask, every wish list card. So that's and, pretty cool. And I guess you got to take it on some faith that it... I did not make this list after these cards came. Like, these were things I genuinely did want for a while before this. It's not just things that happened this year and then I decided retroactively that yeah. this this to to prove the point. That's that's not what I'm doing here. It's Spencer knows. Yeah. We talked about the red rummager for for, for years. years. Yep, yep. Um well so would you want to d- hold off on mentioning those cards specifically and then move on to the sets? Yeah, we'll we'll go through it. Um so I broke this down into sets that were released this year and their accompanying commander decks that came with them. So, first off, we had Kaldheim, which did not have any Commander Precons with it. But, man, it feels like a really long time ago. It does, but but what a way to start the year off. Kaldheim was on it. I mean, I honestly think Kaldheim was my favorite set this year, personally, for red and white cards. Yeah, it might be mine uh, tied with Modern Horizons 2, maybe. It's a good one, too, yeah. But Kaldheim was really cool. I I liked the aesthetic. I liked their special (laughs) showcase cards. And just, um, yeah, lots of good Boro stuff. Especially, like, good white stuff, because people were really, really looking for those, and I think, um, just to not to go over all of them, but, you know, I think r- the the mechanic of the double-faced cards was really, really good for white and red. So cards like Redain, where most of the time you're playing the front half, but every once in a while you play the back half and it could come up. Or cards like Halvar, where it's just great on both ends, honestly. 
I built an Arden and Rograk Partners deck that's Ultron Equipment. And I was so excited for Halvar and Torolf because they're they're both two mana equipments and also four mana creatures, so they perfectly fit into two slots on the curve. Yeah. Um, and I know Eli, we've talked in the past about not being like we're not big Angel Tribal fans, but Righteous Valkyrie is a card I quite like. Yeah, if there was ever a set that actually did something for Angel Tribal, you you would think it'd be like an Innistrad set or something, but no, it was a uh, Kaldheim. Kaldheim more yeah. than anything, I think. We got like the uh, the the white and black uh, kind of angel sub theme there in that in that set, so it's cool. Yeah, and uh, and like you were saying about good white cards, we actually when I when we did our Kaldheim cards you dig episode. I think we had our, our individual lists of cards that we liked, and then our list for white cards was significantly longer than any other color. It's Yeah, I mean, for that is because the foretell mechanic, I think... I, th- I think it's... A, I mean, whatever you think about the mechanic, white certainly got the most good foretell cards. So, I mean, there's just so many good ones. Like, you could you have, like, Doom Scar, Glorious Protector, Cosmic Intervention, Stoic Farmer, just to name a few. And there's at least... I mean, and, and there's at least two others that are, like, medium playable. Yeah, and I think Fortel maybe is an especially good mechanic for Boros because being able to spend your mana efficiently is important. Well, that's good for any deck. But then also, like, your ability to pair Fortel cards with, like, a wheel, like, stash away a couple of cards in in your Fortel zone. Yeah, that's really cool. And then play a wheel to refill your hand. It's like you, you have extra card advantage from that. Another thing is I think um, some Boros decks... Um, don't want to play as many mana rocks as some other decks. I mean, it depends on, like, what you're doing. But if there's ever, like, a Boros creature deck that doesn't really want to curve out with mana rocks, having things to do on turn two is good. And Fortel does let you fit that curve slot, so that's really nice. Yeah, and the card, uh, Glorious Protector, is, like, for, for my wish list I had there, like, protection from Cyclonic Rift or Toxic Deluge, that might be one of the better ones, and it's on an efficient flash creature. Yeah, it, it it reminds me of Restoration Angel in some ways, that it's like a flash flying 3-4 for 4 mana. Um, but was it 3 when you foretell it, right? It's la- even less, or 2? Yeah, three, yeah right. it's three, 3 to... Yeah, but I mean, that's it's. I really like the, the trickiness of they go to play a board wipe, and then you can save your not, you know, non-angel creatures, but pretty much all your creatures... I think it's especially good against Cyclonic Rift, too, because if you flash in your Protector, and then in response to the Rift, you end up with the Protector back in your your hand hand to protect again. That's cool, that's cool. So, yeah, really cool stuff. Um, Anything else you want to say about Kaldheim, Spencer? Um, Just just mention, like, not talk about them, but Gold Spend Dragon and Magda are some of the cool red cards. Oh, we also did get, uh, maybe this is something on the wish list, but we got a red counterspell. True. Tibble's Trickery. Yeah, yeah. And we might mention that again later, but big game. Big game. All right, well, moving on from that, we got uh, Strixhaven um, slash Strixhaven Commander because, you know, we had the decks that came out with that adding a lot more new cards. But Strixhaven was, uh, some proclaimed it to be the Boros Renaissance with, you know, lower hold, right? But... We, let's talk about the cards. Let's talk about the cards. Yeah, yeah, I always love to see it when they're doing a set built around uh, two color combinations and you see that one of them's Boros. That's always good for us. Yeah. But yeah, Strixhaven was especially exciting because this really, uh, I think, brought to the forefront of people's minds. We talked about the three R's yeah. on our first episode. How uh, you can use rummaging and recursion to achieve some kind of card advantage and cheating a mana cost in Boros. And they didn't really have commanders that were focused on this before. Yeah. But then in this set, you literally get Mia and Luca, and mm-hmm. Luca's abilities are the three R's. It's literally rummaging, recursion, and then revenge. Like 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 down the line, like first, second, third abilities on the Planeswalker. It's really cool. Um, I'm not saying we're responsible, just, you know. You know, it's... it's Kind of little, in tune with, you know, with the, the little suspect you know. Wizards of the Coast. Um, another thing that I really liked about uh, this set specifically was um, I liked the two cycling creatures we got in the commander decks. That is Angel of Ruins and uh, what's the other one? What's the red one called? Do you remember? I don't remember. Um, oh, yeah. 
but uh, th- they both have they both have uh, one is plane cycling, one has mountain cycling. They're both artifact creatures for six and seven mana respectively. And they, one of them like lets you wheel when it enters, and the white one exiles two artifacts or enchantments. And I just really like this 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 fits in with this theme of of of, of recursion in red and white that I think uh, is understated sometimes. And having creatures that you can put in the graveyard on your own to get a land and then be able to recur them later is just really awesome. Yeah, they're both really good. I, I think th- I like the Angel a little bit more than Ruin Grinder. I think so too. And Because uh, Ruin Grinder, when it dies, it, the wheel is optional, so it's not... Eh, sometimes that could be better. I mean, if you are like if you like your hand, but yeah. it lets everyone choose. But yeah, they're both really good. They're cool designs at, at the very least. Yep. Um, what do you, what do you like that came out uh, in Strixhaven, Eli? Oh well, we also got like the Curse Mirror. We got Archaeomancer's Map. Some good kind of three mana ramp pieces. Mm-hmm. That, that's something that people have talked about online about how how three mana rocks or three mana ramp is uh, well fallen by the wayside, and there's not a lot of motivation to play it because it needs a little extra push. Yeah, but, uh, Curse Mirror is. Yeah, so if, you, if you have your your three mana ramp that comes into play and says draw a card or get any other ETB effect, like that's you probably play that one. Um, what else? Oh, um, we got checking off the list of uh, the two mana rummager. We got Plarg. Yeah, literally all I wanted was a two mana one one that you just tap to rummage, and then we got Plarg, which is a two mana two two. You can tap to rummage, but you can also he has the ability to pay five mana tap him. And you get a three CMC or less non-legendary card from the top of your deck. Yeah, you cast it. Um, it's, and it's so good. Just draw a card and cast it. Yeah. And and gravy, it's even got a back half that you can play sometimes. Um, so that's nice. Yeah, if you if you ever would. <laughs> but, well, maybe you're attacking for lethal. There you go. And it, it pumps yeah, the team. Yeah, he could even just not have that side. And it would still be everything I wanted more. So it's just, it's crazy how, how much better Plarg is than... I could have imagined. Um, and speaking of Plarg, just a cool card that they printed. They got we got uh, Conspiracy Theorist, which I think is 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 actually surprisingly good. It pretty much makes it so um, the first time you discard, I think it's the first time, or is it is it one? Is it every time you discard? I think it might be every time you discard. Um, you essentially get to discard one of your cards into one of the non-land cards into Impulsive Draw, essentially. Mm-hmm. So you can cast it, or you can play it, I guess cast it because it doesn't do lands, this turn. And then it also has a, a rummaging effect on attack if you pay one mana. But I really like that it doesn't like require you to pay one mana to do his effect, only like if you have to like get use him to discard. So like, if you have Plarg and Conspiracy Theorist out every turn, it's like drawing an extra card if you're going to cast something in your hand. Yeah, that's a really interesting form of card advantage. Yeah, it's I think it's cool. Um, anything else you want to talk about, Eli, in uh, Strixhaven? No, just uh, there was a lot of good stuff. The the lore hold thing. It's it's cool to see uh, people think about that more. And and you know it, it, they they might think it's uh, it's a brand new thing, but I think it might force some people to evaluate. Hey, what could I do with existing cards and these themes? Yeah, it, it, the nice thing about lore hold is it, is it kind of was able to make the themes more apparent. You know, themes that. You and I think already existed, but now they're more obvious because there's a commander that does it, right? Yeah. Or some some multicolored cards like Lorehold Command that do some of the things. That's a pretty cool card too. Yeah, it's um, it's nice to see different theming sometimes in Boros because even if even if you can achieve the rummaging and recursion with just red cards, like mono red and mono white cards, it's cool to see actual like multicolored Boros cards that do that stuff. Yeah, yeah, very. It's a welcome welcome addition. All right, uh, up next we have Modern Horizons 2. This was a big one. Yeah. We got some really, really important stuff. Starting off with uh, Esper Sentinel. Espy Senti, my man. You know what you know what you can do to make my, my heart sing? Is you print a card um, that does something, whatever, in Boros, okay? And then you make it a one-drop, so it's tutorable um, in, in, with white creatures. And then you make it have one toughness, so it's skull clampable. And then I'm in love. So, Esper Sentinel checks every box that I want. And I know it's not quite Mystic Remora. But, man, it's, <laughs> it's that and it's kind of close in Honestly, white. Honestly, a little bit. Um, and it's, you know, it doesn't have all the downsides of Mystic Remora, too. So Yeah, it's a creature. It holds equipment and attacks. Yep. So, we love that. It doesn't have an upkeep cost. <laughs> and then uh, we're checking off another thing on my list. Uh, free Interaction. We got Solitude and Fury. Mm-hmm. 
Solitude, I think, um, possibly a new staple if it wasn't so expensive. If it wasn't $50, yeah, I could see that. <laughs> Great card. And Fury also, I think, got pretty expensive now, but I think that's uh, better than it gets credit for. And another thing that's, like, really cool in this set is, like, just the sheer number of, like, good cards that don't seem to, like... They don't seem like... They're not commander powerhouses. But you would never, like, look at these cards and be like, oh, okay, why are you playing that? And I'm thinking of cards like Brea's Apprentice, where it's it's it makes a dude, it can impulsive draw on its own, and it can fit into artifact decks, but it's not, like, an auto-include. Yeah, it's, there's, it's... there's so many good cards like that in this set. Like, Obsidian Charma is a card that I picked up thinking, this seems really good, this feels like a card that could go in any Boros deck... And then I just never put it in a deck because there's so many, many other good, good things. Cards. But I mean, like it's it's fine. Like it's not bad at all. Um, yeah, not you know. There's a lot of good cards that come out. Can't talk about them all. So let's move on uh, to the D and D set, Adventures in the Forgotten Realms, and the commander with it too. Yeah, I had a uh, before doing this video, I forgot how closely these sets came out to each other. But the Modern Horizons two was June, and then AFR was July. Yeah, right after. So, but, really cool cards. Uh, I really liked they when they printed uh, Loyal Warhound, kind of a retrain of Knight of the White Orchid. Uh, worse, but it's hard to get much better than Knight of the White Orchid. So, like that card. I think possibly the best card that came out in this set was Fighter Class or Oswald Fiddlebender. Mm -hmm. Just being really, like, getting more tutors yeah, yeah, in Boros. Yeah. Really, really good stuff. Um, I know, er, Eli, one of the things that you said was protection from Rift, and we got Guardian of Faith, which phases out all of your creatures, so that's protection. Yeah, it seems so good, but that's another one I haven't even played a chance much, to play right? with. Yeah. Um, and people, and I, and I just want to take a moment to point out, um, we got some creatures that are the faded stat line, well, the faded stat line, if you don't know the lore, this is the format of 4-4, four -four, and... Up until a couple years ago, there were, like, two or three 4-mana four 4-4s four in white. Like, it seemed like white just didn't get, like, this stat line. So, for example, uh, Halvar is a faded, the faded stat line. And I think Fae Steed is a 4-mana four 4-4 four from this set. The commander yeah, deck, I think. Yeah, we here at uh, EDH takes are of the belief that the most efficient... <laughs> uh, what would you call it? The... The best you can get with the vanilla test, sure, is four mana four four. It's it's just a it's a good meme, okay. Um, but I think people underestimate this face steed Mia uh, effect, which is when your stuff gets targeted, you draw cards. Um, and the reason that I I mean, you you have people like the Command Zone and other other podcasts saying things like they're doing like the 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 pre con deck reviews, and they're like. Let's check how much remove how much single target removal is in this deck. Twelve? Hmm, maybe that's a little low for what I would play. When people are suggesting you play so much removal, like how can how can you see a card that says when your stuff gets targeted, draw a card and think it's not gonna at least replace itself? I mean I guess you could get board wiped, but if, if the card does something else besides that as well, like you're 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 it's it's insurance. Yeah, we've talked about on the show before how I feel too much single target removal is actually slightly detrimental to you and you should build your commander decks to be able to survive or like win an attrition battle of one person using a bunch of single target removal on you you should be able to come out ahead on that i think if your deck's built right but where it gets tough is when you're in the the lead or the arch enemy position and you feel like multiple people are using their spot removal on you having a card like that yeah i think really <laughs> puts you at like you just they have to kill that first. And that's another... Pe like, they don't have infinite removal. Well, yeah, and, like, if let's say you have a face steed and something that actually needs to die, like, they have to kill the thing that needs to die and then the face steed. Or, or, like, because they... I mean, if... I guess by definition, if you have something that needs to die, it needs to die, right? Mm -hmm. So they don't have the, the, the... They just don't have the ability to just, like, wait a turn and kill the face steed first. So, if you can get one or two cards off of a face steed kind of effect, I think it's done its job. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty happy with that effect. That's a card I should uh, pick up too. Yeah, I just always want to play Mia instead because I find it's just better most yeah, of the time. Yeah, she's good too. Um, but whatever. Moving on. Oh, I guess also the dragons. We got the the dragons in that set too. I think Icing Death is 
is uh, the best Boros one. Yeah, you got Icing Death and Inferno of the Star Mounts, which... It's cool. That, that seems cool, too, but I think that one was actually a little pricey, so I just never picked it never up. Never picked one up. Um, what's up next? Uh, we got both Innistrad sets. We have Midnight Hunt uh, first. So what what about Midnight Hunt? Did you like, Eli? Well, we got the uh, the Brutal Cathar, our Flip Werewolf Boros... Our Boros Werewolf. Let's go. A, kind of a new thing. That's maybe not like... A, an amazing commander card, but I think it could be cool. But one that I do think is pretty amazing is Adeline, Resplendent Cathar. Oh, I love Adeline. Quite good. Skull Clamp Machine. And she just gets really big. Like, we were talking about four mana 4-4s. Four yeah. She's probably a three mana 4-4 four four most of the time, at least. Well, when you curve out into her, like, like, like you play two drop on two, and then you play her on three and then attack... Um, maybe you lose one or two of the tokens, right? Let's say you lose two tokens, generously. You probably won't, but let's say you lose two of the tokens. Yeah. That means you have one of the tokens left, your two drop, and Adeline. Next turn, you attack. You maybe play another creature and attack with Adeline. What is that? That's a 7-4 attack. Yeah, she's big. On turn four. So, and that's assuming you lost two tokens, so. And she's also generating you card advantage by making those tokens, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very nice. Um, we also had the, uh, the Intrepid Cycle. I think, uh... I think the red and the white ones are pretty good. Not, like, amazing, but the the white one being an anthem creature that you can play on multiple slots on your curve and maybe even give your creatures up to plus two, plus two, or yeah. plus three, plus three. That can be a big game. Depending on how much mana you have. I think those those are those nice flexible cards are, are like, they're not going to be bad is the thing, right? Yeah. And then I think the biggest card from Midnight Hunt for Boros Commander would be Vanquish the Horde. Mm-hmm. Because that's oh, yeah. potentially a, a two-mana a board wipe. staple. Yeah, I think that's uh, on the level of Blasphemous Act. Yeah. Oh, and uh, uh, just talking about the wish list cards, something I forgot to mention in the Adventures of the Forgotten Realms is we got a cantrip creature to hit the wish list thing. We got the the priest of the of ancient lore. Oh, yep. So just to just to you know, we didn't forget about that wish list. Don't worry. Yeah, and then uh, Midnight Hunt, we got the Red Archaeomancer. Yeah. So that. Takes off the last wish list card, right? I think yeah, so. Yeah, so uh, pretty much everything. Uh, then we got our last set of the year, Innistrad Crimson Vow and the Crimson Vow Commander decks. Yeah. Um, we got the Cemetery Cycle. I think we both like those okay. Yeah, they're pretty cool. We both got a Cemetery Protector to try out. I haven't cast it yet, but I ex- it seems good. I expect it will get cut when new good cards come out, or old good cards uh get get realized but uh definitely a consideration card but i think you and i both talked about how we we don't like playing too many graveyard hate cards because it's kind of it's a little overdone well the thing is like i think you i I think people will say cards like tormod script are very important or or like the one mana artifacts that at least replace themselves but I feel like if you can pair your um, Graveyard Hate with another function in your deck, like a creature that does it, like a, like a Scavenging Ooze, or, for example, like this this Graveyard Cycle, it's a lot better. Mm-hmm. So you're not, like, taking a slot for the Graveyard Hate. You're, you're, you know, it's incidental Graveyard Hate. It's a proactive as well as a reactive yeah, card. Yeah, that's what I like about it. And then we got, a, we got the, the Dragon, Moonvale Regent, kind of like a Monastery Mentor Dragon thing. Seems pretty good. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Change of Fortune could be a good card in a lot of decks that like to rummage and, and wheel, like we were talking about Strixhaven earlier, and yeah, doing the rummaging and recursion. It's like a it's like a theme, and maybe if you play a wheel and then you play that afterwards, you get to draw like 14 cards or 13 cards, I think. Seems cool, yeah. Um, Welcoming Vampire seems like a really good card. I think you and I both picked that up. and No complaints. I've been played it yet, but pretty happy with it. The thing I really, like, good. I really like about that card is how well it pairs with uh, Ephemerate, which is, I think, one of the... Even if you're not playing Blink in uh, your like a Blink deck, I think Ephemerate can often just like be good in a lot of Boros decks because it's a two-for-one for one mana, essentially. Like You can get like two ETBs off it. And if you have a... Um, if you have a uh, welcoming vampire, you can blink your two power or less creature on an opponent's turn, then have it come blink it back the rebound on your turn. You can get the the two draws off it as well as the ETBs. Yeah, and this kind of a tangent, but I I had a list of good common like playable cards from this year, and one card I know some people like a lot is Blacksmith Skill as like a protection spell, like a one off for for one card. I really personally don't think those cards are very good, and I think you should just always play something like Ephemerate instead. Yeah, I guess... Because it does that thing and then also generates you some value. 
I think Ephemerate's amazing. I think people want the blacksmith's, but blacksmith's skill when they are trying to get like an attack off or something, right? That's when it's nice. But uh, yeah. I'm, but I think uh, for the most part, I am with you that I have not been uh, per- a person that puts that in my decks very often. Um, but that does it for all the sets that came out this year. Uh, trying to keep things moving because we have a lot to talk about. Yeah, we just kind of had a we have a list of some playable commons on commons because that's the one one big thing we wanted to shout out is uh, the cards we listed just now for the most part all rares and mythic rares and those can get expensive sometimes so yep. that's one really uh, valid criticism criticism we got on our first episode was somebody responded really thoughtfully and said this, these are all good points but to be fair a lot of these cards you mentioned like land tax weather wayfair and stuff. A lot of these good, powerful staples are very expensive, and uh, and I responded to that and said, "Yeah, that's a really good point, and uh, we should keep that in mind." So it'd be really nice to have more kind of just play the game cards at common on common. Yeah, that's another reason why Modern Horizons Two was so good because they reprinted Imperial Recruiter, and that was a <laughs> brought that down to less than ten dollars. Oh, yeah, it it got pretty cheap for a while. I'm not I think sure if it still I think is. It still is. But yeah, if it's less than ten dollars, you should pick up Imperial Recruiter because that's maybe one of the best cards oh, to have man. for a Boros deck. Yeah, you can. Oh, just a slight tangent. Imperial Recruiter get Stoneforge Mystic. Stoneforge Mystic gets Skull Clamp. Play Skull Clamp. Clamp the Imperial Recruiter. Oh, it's so good. It's so clean. <laughs> or you just play it on Curve and then you get like uh, Mangar the Diplomat and play that or something on four. Yeah, you have so much, so much uh, value with that card. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, you want to just. Uh, just quickly name off these uh, some of these commons and uncommons. Yeah, like like we said, uh, we got a uh, I got my ardent elementalist. That's the red archaeomancer, which is also skull clampable. Yeah, and also more splashable because it's not double pip. I think that card. Yeah, I think it being a two one versus the original archaeomancer being a one two is actually an upside in yeah. this case because it's skull clampable. It's very nice. Yeah, and then uh, we got some plane searcher cards. Yeah, the creatures that come in and ETB search for a planes and put them into your hand. Uh, ambitious farmhands, the best one. Pilgrim Ages is kind of eh, but it's still playable. Yeah, very uh, very bread and butter. Kind of just hit your land drops. Yeah, keep advancing your board. And and like I said about cantrip creatures, those I think those fit the bill too. They don't necessarily draw a card, but they draw you a planes. Yeah, but like 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 I mentioned earlier with um, welcoming vampire. Like imagine you go well you go. Uh, ambitious farmhand on two, welcoming vampire on, vampire on three, and then on four you like play a creature with two power less, draw a card, pass the turn, blink your uh, your ambitious farmhand on someone else's turn, draw another card, get a planes. You know, it, it just it, it is it's a lot of value with these cards. Yeah, and that's another thing of just seeing all the cards that came out that generate value because we talked about on the first episode how you don't really need to play Boros the same way as other color combinations. You can play like a more aggressive strategy or like avoid playing ramp even. But there's just you can play like a classic commander deck. Yeah, like with a, a lot of these cards. Like a curve out uh deck, or you can play like a like like a slow value uh accruing deck. Did you mention Cathar Commando yet? I did not don't recall. Not yet, but that is, that a, is a good one. Very good one. Yeah, Cathar Commando. Um Davney da, uh sorry, Gavany Dawn Guard is is uh, interesting. Um, we've got Dragon's Rage Channeler. That one's probably the most pricey of these commons and uncommons, but it's it, it it's got its place in certain decks. Um, late late to dinner, not the best uh, recursion spell, but pretty on par. Uh, I think we've we've seen back in the other day a long time ago four mana white recur or sorry a reanimated creature, and this is like strictly, just strictly better, strictly better that. So that's cool. And I, and I mostly put that on the list because I I like to see the the recursion in white. Yeah, sticking back because I think there was a point when uh, people were wondering if that was gonna be a thing in in white anymore, if it was just gonna be restricted to just three CMC or less. Yeah, and uh, no, seeing that is yeah, we can get any we can get any mana cost creatures now. Yeah, so. that's or cool. In the past too, but like again, I suppose. And then like we like we were saying, we got the priest of ancient lore, search party captain, being ETB draw a card creature, so you can flicker those in yeah. white decks. Um, reconstruct history is a cool card. That's a big card advantage card. Is uh is showdown at the skulls uncommon? That is a rare. Okay, but that's I that's a good one. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then but, we got secret rendezvous, which yeah. uh more most commander players would be like secret rendezvous. Yeah. <laughs> it's bad. It's not that bad. I mean, it's not obviously you know it's a cost, but uh, you know if if we can if we can give uh 
other cards props for being political cards, you can give Secret Rendezvous props for being a political card. You can find it places to play it. Yeah, that's one thing. Like, we're going to move into our next section soon and talk about some some double standards maybe, but people will be like, like, look at some bad card and be like, oh, this downside, this is just a cool political tool. How fun, how awesome this is. But they don't seem to apply that to Boros cards or white cards, And then, right? like, white card draw cards comes out and they're like, oh, what is this? Is what? No, why would I ever play this? Cringe. Um... Well, uh, another quickly another thing. Uh, not uh, after talking about commons and uncommons, I just want to point out a couple um, interesting designs that they had this year that I would like to see maybe more, maybe not. Um, I think actually, abiding grace is an uncommon, right? Yep. Yeah, so that's I guess that kind of bridges the gap. I think abiding grace is a cool card that we got because it kind of fits into this idea of like one drop tribal which is an interesting thing that I think White has kind of been doing for a little bit. They've got, like, uh, some creatures that um, tutor up one-drop creatures, and I think it's actually an interesting uh, concept that I think they could maybe uh, go more into. How do you think... What do you feel about yeah, one-drop I, tribal? I love one-drop. I have a whole package in my mono-white deck just based around Ranger of Eos, Ranger Captain of Eos, and yeah. I have, like, close to ten one-drop creatures, I think. So if they made, like, a cool... If I was, like, designing a new mono-white or white-red or white-blue commander i might try to look for some kind of cool one drop matters uh effect might be interesting yeah one I love drop those creatures cards. specifically um and then you know you got like bergy who is a like a kind of like a storm uh effect that i don't think you are i mean you do get like rituals in red but i don't think you usually get like whenever you cast a spell get mana right and i think she also stops the mana from emptying when oh your nice change. that's cool so you can kind of play that storm effect and uh yeah and then Chef's Kiss is just a kind of a wacky card, but I think it's it's a little bit uh, a little bit cool. Fun uh, tangent about Bergy. Uh, I drafted Caldheim like four or five different times, and every time I did, I had a Bergy. Yeah. In every deck. Yeah. It's um, three mana three three. Uh, yeah. Sometimes uh, late game becomes an impulse. Draw. I'm still surprised that it's a three mana three three. Right? Like I always every time I think of Bergy, I think it's like four mana, but it's it's just a three drop. And I guess it's probably because the back half is five, I think. Yep. So that's why I, I split the difference. Um, but the back half's kind of cool, too. So if you want to play that sort of thing. Yeah, I like the back half. The horn. Um, well, what do you say we move on, Eli, to talking yeah. less about cards and more about people? Section two. The perception from the community. Yeah. So, like we were saying, when we originally made our first episode at the start of the year... We wanted to dispel the com- some of the common narratives about how Boros can't do this and they can't do that. Boros can't ramp. Boros can't car- do card draw. And I think we did a good job of that. So if you want to, you know, you can watch that episode if you want to. Yeah, we were like, don't tell me what I can do. Yeah. Uh, I think something we mentioned at one point was it kind of felt like a lot of the criticism of Boros was coming from people that don't play Boros. And I feel like some of that still reigns true to this day a little bit. Um, but it was a good year. It was a good year for Boros. I think a lot of players did start playing Boros this year, especially with the release of, like, Ozgear, the command, the pre-con, right? I feel like on Magic Twitter, I've seen a lot of people talking about, like, their Winota decks or, like, yeah. new decks that they built over this last year and yeah, really cool Boros stuff. So I think that's been a, a, a nice positive change on Boros's end, or for Boros, I suppose, this year. But, um, you know, I, pe- I hope people realize, will start to realize that you know, Boros really is, has come far from how it was five years ago, or something like that. Um, not even just the last year, but the last three, four years. Mm-hmm. And that's not to say that Boros was, like, garbage five years ago, just that, you know, it's it's, it's different. Um, so what do you want to talk about, Eli? Maybe about, um, do you think opinions have changed over the years, over this this year specifically? I think that opinions have changed in the majority of the community i think just there's still enough loud voices Mm -hmm. where their opinions haven't changed or or they have changed and they're just not representing that because it's it's funny to go with the meme right yeah it's there if there's even like a certain majority of your your listener base or something that that likes to hear the thing you're gonna say the thing do the thing bart say the (laughs) thing bart yeah. yeah exactly um no but do you want to like take a moment to just describe the meme for those that might not be unaware somehow? Oh, just the 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 white is bad, Boros bad meme. Like yeah, how Pe- mm. people can just talk about 
like anytime spoiler season comes out and you'll have like random commons and uncommons especially for white cards and this this will kind of tie into uh to a thing we're working on soon mm-hmm. but there'll there'll be white cards coming out and people will be like oh my god like this is so bad like what what would, what would i expect from white and then they'll have like they'll make their custom green card next to it that's like a two mana six six, six, six that like draws your deck and and wins the game on the spot and has haste and trip trample and vigilance and everything yeah and it's like this this criticism like it's not it's not valid i don't think it's valid anymore no um and it's frustrating because people will still kind of do this um and i guess um to to get into that specifically one thing that happened this year that really bothered me was um i one of our episodes um i believe it was um like in may or something whenever the adventure in the forgotten realm set came out um the edh rec cast uh joey made a big tweet about how he was so upset when they printed um, the Brunor, Brunor Battle Hammer, yeah. Battle Hammer, because it was a Boros equipment commander, and he was so tired of that uh, thing. And as we said on that episode, um, Joey, this is not fair at all. You know, you wouldn't extend this same standard to any other color combination. Like he's a big, like he's a necromancer, right? Like he likes like 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 reanimation. Yeah, he likes right? Golgari, mono black. He played, and when they put print like a, a Golgari, like when they made like stick fingers, he was like, "Oh my god, I love this card because it, you know, it like fills your graveyard and it lets me reanimate things." It's like it's really not fair at all, and people just kind of do this as a meme. Like it's not funny to be just like <laughs> Boros equipment. Yeah, sometimes like there's people who will participate this that in this that I think I think they're smart people, yeah. and I think they can have good takes and good opinions and I, I gotta wonder like do they actually believe this or do they just like want to believe this? it feels like they're being blinded by the meme you know yeah. so and and just to to quickly talk so um and you would think maybe okay maybe this year has been good and they've kind of stopped doing it but dana for on that same on the same uh their same podcast well at the end of the year they're there i didn't think they did their they're thankful for a series or something or no it wasn't that episode it was Whatever. It was one of the recent episodes they did. And Dana was talking about how we got a real, you know, the, the three um, color combinations that he thought maybe didn't have interesting commanders in the past got a lot of really interesting commanders this year. And he says, if you would have asked me earlier this year, like what color pairings had the least amount of interesting commanders, I would have said Rakdos, Demir and Boros. Um, I feel like there's been an effort made this calendar year to give us an interesting, diverse spread of Demir commanders, which we're seeing this here, of Rakdos mm. commanders, which we've seen throughout the course of the year when we talked about on our Thankful show, and giving us Boros equipment commanders, which we've seen all year. Um, <laughs> so, that we've seen all decade. You yeah, can, right, right. All so, um, And it's just really annoying because of the two of, of the 13 Boros commanders that came out this year, two of them were equipment commanders. And I don't know why, like... Is he, like, do you think it's, like, purposefully ignoring that for the meme, Eli? Or, like, is it just, like, some, like, hate boner? What is the thing? What do you think? I don't know, man, but I I feel like if we went through a year like this and people just stopped doing the meme or just stopped saying, like, oh, this is so bad or this is boring, you wouldn't have other people just parrot it or, like, just believe it blindly. Yeah. Like, I think I told a story, an anecdote of of a game I played at a game shop few months ago and somebody was playing a kind of just like lower like mid power like winota deck and they oh i remember they had like five cards in their hand they had a pretty full board they had been board wiped like twice before this when they're like extending into the board more than any other deck and and i just had a bunch of cards in my hand because i just wasn't like playing it i was playing like my shadrix deck and i would just like play shadrix draw a card wait for the board wipe and pass and that's like all i was doing so i had a full grip Mm -hmm. and we were playing with like a five color dragons deck or no we were playing um i think it was maelstrom wanderer dragons deck and somebody else and they just out of nowhere they just they just say they look at like their five cards in their hand they're like man boros really sucks and i'm like (laughs) yeah what what are you what are you talking about (laughs) what are you talking about like you you sound insane (laughs) you got a grip in your hand you've been playing the game more than anyone else you've had the most board you've gotten board wipe twice you're still playing what do you mean bro yeah and they won that game by the way so i don't know i just yeah well that kind of transitions into 
um, this kind of double standard concept um, that we've been talking about a little bit. Because on that same axis, you'll hear um, you'll hear people like the command zone, or uh, I'm sure you've heard it elsewhere. Um, they'll have a really good set come out with like I think a recent set. One of the one of the um, one of the Innistrad sets came out, and they're like, "White got the most cards in this set. Like, White got the best cards." And they're like, "Wow, that's awesome. Maybe in five more sets, we'll see a difference." And it's just really frustrating because it feels like players can't um, see any form of incrementalism. They just can only see like start and finish. And I don't know. It's very frustrating to me. Um, what do you think about this this double standard kind of stuff, Eli? I feel like Magic players, and especially in the Commander community tend to see different as always worse. Like, they're, they're always... Maybe we, we might end up doing an, an episode on on comparison, but mm-hmm. I, my mom always told me that uh, that comparison is the thief of joy. If you're always comparing yourself to something else or, like, the, what other people have, it's kind of like... It's like envy. Oh, yeah, like people do, like, the, oh, green has Rex Sage, white has... Question mark, question mark, question mark. And it's like, white has different things. Like, we got that new... um that new modal uh, one three for two that like can exile an enchantment or a card from a graveyard or gain two life. Or yeah, something. like they're different effects. And we got the new Cathar Commando, which is a uh, Rex Sage, but it has flash and it does it in a different way than just ETB. And I think it's uh, like we were talking about how people evaluate things in spoiler season. There will be two. There'll be a white card and a green card sometimes that do slightly similar things. And if if the green card is better than the white card in any aspect. Not even, like, like it has, like, one more toughness, but the ability's worse. Like, any part of the card, if it's better, they'll just complain. Yeah, like, I think this happened with uh, the Cemetery Protector and the green one of the cycle, which, the green one is good. You could maybe, you could make an argument that it's a better card than the white one. That one's the wolf, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think they're very different cards. It's, it's, they're not really, yeah, I, I think, you, I mean, yeah, like you said, it could go either way, but... Because it has, what is it, like a 4-4 instead of a 3-4 or something? Or it's 3-mana? It's, it's a 3-mana three 3-4, three and the white one's a 4-mana four four 3-4. Four. Four. But they're completely different. Like, they're just like, this one costs one less, so it's better. I don't know. It's a bit dumb. Yeah, it's a lot of false equivalencies, I think. And talking about, uh, talking about that uh, idea of incrementalism, I feel like um, players... It feels like players will treat Boros as if it's not there yet and like far away from being like as good as you know other colors until it actually is so like let's say like let's say boros is like 50 percent of the way to being as good as other colors um as sets come out you know it gets presumably gets 60 percent 70 percent 80 percent 90 percent then 100 percent right it feels like players will treat it as it is 50 percent until some at some point it eventually just ticks over to 100 they can't see the in-between Mm-hmm. And I think, Eli, you and I think that, you know, we're at 100% right now, right? Like, Boros is as good as other colors, at least on the level of. That's how I feel, man. Like, I I don't know, like, not... Maybe I just feel a little big for my britches, but I feel like I've got some pretty good... Tools, right? Boros decks, and I, I know you've got a really good Boros deck, so... And I've never... In the games we've played in the different environments, I've never seen a struggle that that I could think, wow, this is specifically because it's a Boros deck. Yeah, like, I can't, like, I don't have the tools to overcome this. No, that's not the case. I mean, maybe you could say, like, you don't have the same tools as, as other colors, but, like, you have, but every, every color is, is lacking something, right? That's the whole point of the color pie. Yeah, I've got my criticisms with Mono White, but they're definitely not from a ramp and card advantage perspective anymore. No, um, I, I, I would, like, not to go off of, you know, go off in too much of a tangent. I, I do probably think that mono white is probably the worst mono color. Um, maybe, I mean, I, I think probably, but it's not really, it's not, we're talking about Boros, right? Like, it's, it's, it's a whole different story. Yeah, exactly. Like, they just, I think red and white just complement each other so well. Yeah, I agree. Um, and white in general complements other colors very well. So, that's very nice. I think that's, yeah, I think that's totally true, actually, that white may be... Yeah, fits with other colors, just, just, people always say that about, like, white being a support color, but really, it, it always adds something. Yeah, 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 which is nice. Um, whether it be, you know, Graveyard Hate, like, Path of Exile, not Path of Exile, sorry, Rest in Peace, or, you know, good removal, good board wipes, good protection spells, stuff like that. Yeah, stuff you need. Yeah. 
Um, well, what do you think, Eli? Um, what do you want to talk about next? There's a lot of things to mention. Um, oh, do you want to talk about how... Uh, we talked about it a bit earlier, but the idea that um, for everything that we've got this year, people are acting like Boros got a ton of new like themes in Lorehold. Because I know we did we talked a little bit about the Lorehold meme when we were talking about Lorehold earlier, but... Oh, yeah. Uh, we wanted to acknowledge that everyone over this last year since uh, Strixhaven came out, anytime somebody says Boros, they're like, do you mean Lorehold? And it's like, no, no, I don't. <laughs> I don't mean Lorehold. Um, and, and I feel like that stems from people thinking that Lorehold is somehow like a step up from Boros or doing things that Boros never did. Yeah, and also that Boros is like this pariah of the color combinations. If you play a Boros deck or admit that you like Boros, that's like, what are you, dumb? You could just be playing good colors instead. Yeah, I, I we, we did a, a section on one of our old podcasts about the Professor Lorehold video about how he talks about how um, Lorehold is a step, is like, like a big step, and if we go back to the, the if Boros goes back to its combat phase... Um, you know, it'll, it's like a step back in the wrong direction. Yeah. And we really do not agree with that at all. So, maybe I'll just play a clip here and you can kind of see that from what we talked about before. Or mm -hmm. you can go watch that episode um, if you want to hear more about that. Um, what do you want to talk about, Eli? What's, what's next? Oh, should we uh, should we discuss the, the Schrodinger's green player? Yeah, sure. Do you want to introduce this topic, Eli? So, this was just a, a, a funny idea we had about how... There's been, especially this year, there's been more of the uh, the white ketchup ramp printed. Yeah. And that stuff will get previewed or spoiled. And and some people like it, So, and I like it. But you'll see a lot of people saying, this is this mechanic is bad. It's not good for, if you, for actually like getting you ahead in the game. Yeah. And I just think, well, you're losing most of the time in Commander. So that's, that's what I like about it. 75% of the time, sure. You're yeah. usually behind. Um, and you can do some cool tricks with it too, but people believe, like we were saying about the comparison to green cards, there's this weird belief of that, that green is like so insanely ahead of the other colors and just like so strong, but at the same time, your, your white ketchup ramp isn't going to trigger because the green deck is, doesn't have more lands than you for some reason. Yeah. Like the green decks simultaneously will have like 20 lands on turn six, they think, but also, also your ketchup ramp won't work as well. So I don't know the like it, this is the idea you know related to the Schrodinger's box where the 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 cat in the box is not, you don't know if it's dead or alive because you don't know until you open the box and see if it's alive or not so you don't know until <laughs> I hope you see the comparison to the the green the green player maybe. I just we we think it's interesting because it's it's very uh, it's serving a narrative it's either green is OP because I don't like green cards. Or it's it's not that good because I want to shit on the white cards. So yeah, th there's an argument to be had about the power level of green compared to the rest of the format. But this is not the way to to uh, to approach it. You know, it feels like green cards often will be looked at, or green decks will be looked at in kind of a magical Christmas land scenario. And then when you look at a Boros or a white card, you kind of imagine the worst case scenario. And that's just not a very intellectual way to to approach that conversation. Yeah, and that that reminds me of one of the the biggest examples of that from this year. We we mentioned this video on an earlier episode, but they had the Playing with Power podcast. They had Alex from the Spike Feeders guest on and talk about Boros. And like we were saying earlier about we felt that people were talking about Boros that hadn't played a lot of Boros. Man, I got I got vibes of that big yeah. from this video. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the, he was talking about um the card endurance from the uh, the elemental cycle yeah. from Modern Horizons two, and how it's so much better than the other the rest of the cycle because it's a three mana, three, three four. four. And it's like yeah, it's it's cheaper, but like its effect like is it? <laughs> you're comparing things that like don't like the the non important aspects of the card. I, I think what I recall from that uh, from what he said was that uh, solitude counter or uh, uh, answers a card. And endurance answers a game plan. I think that's something he said very uh, <laughs> kind of high on himself there a little bit. And it's, <laughs> I guess, but I don't know. I think uh, Solitude is a at least twice as good as Endurance in Commander. 
by by far. Yeah, and just that that whole video. Um, I remember as far as the Boros aspects of that, because uh, mostly it just I was disappointed by that video because I felt it was false advertising because it just devolved into the white versus green debate. Yeah, for most of it. But when they did talk about Boros, it was Alex really uh really sucking off uh, Alibu from the Strixhaven commander deck. Yeah, we no, like Alibu. We like Alibu, but he was saying stuff. I mean, and we talked about this before, but he was saying stuff like, "Yeah, I think, I think, like the answer." He was saying the answer to like, you know, the card advantage problem in Boros and White is like Scry. Scry is the answer, and I think you and I just definitely don't agree with that. Well, he was saying Scry and also Modular. Yeah, which Modular is, I don't know. Like, I know there's some cool commander decks that can be built around that. I've I've seen a couple that friends have had. It's like I think one that, of the worst mechanics. I think that does nothing to acknowledge card advantage. Like it's not it's just getting plus one plus one counters on your on like one creature when Something. single creatures die. Like you get board wiped, like what's the And also only artifact creatures, right? Yeah. <laughs> but Esper Sentinel is an artifact creature. Okay. Uh no, uh I don't know. I agree with you. I agree with you, life pretty much all And about it's just that. like why I can't believe that you would think that was like a good thing for Boros if you actually played Boros decks, like, oh you know what I really needed? With some artifact creatures that get plus one plus one counters on them. Yeah. <laughs> like, what? Like, you're going to talk about, like, yeah, I, we need more card advantage, we need this, this, and this, and then be like, plus one plus one counters. Yeah. No, not, uh... I don't, I don't understand, man. It, it confuses me. Well, what's what's next on the list of things? Oh, we, we made it through the uh, the player uh, perception section. Did I we want to... Did we want to talk about the... I, de- I don't know oh, where to put yeah, this. We should, yeah, I have a section. Before we move on. I have a section here on our notes that is labeled, I don't know where to put this. <laughs> um, I guess I'll just uh, kind of discuss it a little bit. So the idea is that I think a lot of, one reason that players have a hard time um, building good Boros decks um, is that for many of the commanders, they don't follow kind of a standard deck building formula that maybe m- most of the rest of the format kind of follows. So, for example, um, the idea of playing a deck that doesn't want to um, ramp on turn two or something, like, for example, a, a three-mana Tajik deck or something, that that's very foreign to a lot of players. I think there was a Twitter uh, conversation that we, we that, that happened. Uh, maybe I'll find oh, it and yeah. put it up. Our boy Peter, Mono White Border, was so freaking based. <laughs> it was, yeah, he, they were, he was talking about the idea of uh, building decks without ramp or or with less ramp and and trying it out and that it might be a fun thing and then uh shivam we know shivam from the keg yeah uh replied to him and was like uh oh, i tried this one time but uh but i got sick of losing or yeah. something along those lines and and peter freaking bodied him maybe we'll put the tweets up yeah on, uh, yeah the image but yeah it's i i like that idea of, of trying that out and i think it is more functional than people uh give it credit for yeah um so i i think like you were saying um, it, it's that idea can be very alien to people. It's very easy to get set in your ways and be like, okay, way to, way to play commander, ramp and card draw, ramp and card draw. But I mean, in Boros, um, a lot of your card advantage has to be incremental or conditional. And I think that can be scary to players. So they don't, they don't, they just don't, they just do without it. Cause they think, or they play like mind's eye or something. I liked, um, Ari Nia had a good quote on the dies to removal podcast where he's talking to uh, the professor in Pleasant Kenobi about how card advantage works in Commander and how white decks specifically ask you to invest your resources onto the battlefield, which is not a very safe place in Commander. Yeah. And I think that's like you were saying, like, people see that as, as scary, because, like, what if a board wipe happens? Like, I'm losing all these resources. And the hand, the hand is a bit more sacred in Commander than it is in Right, like, formats. yeah, keeping just a bunch of cards in your hand, like, and it's... It's especially tough for the Boros player because people threat assess the person with the, the most cards on the battlefield rather than the person with the most cards in their hand. Yeah. Like, there could be a player, I think, with ten cards in their hand, but if they don't have, like... A lot of mana or a big board. Yeah, then people won't assess them as like, a Like, oh, I can, they can't do anything too fast, right? Like, well, that's fine. Because um, Commander actually is a lot of a tempo game as well as it is a, a resource accumulation game, too. Because if you have ten cards but five mana, you're not going to be able to use them all. Um, at least for over, over the course of several turns. But I, this is a tangent that's not important. Right, but I, I'm of the belief that actually uh, in, in this modern day of Commander, especially people talk about how it's getting faster, faster and more competitive. There are so many 
mana positive effects that you you might have an yeah. opponent with with a full grip and not very many lands and you think what yeah, are they gonna do yeah they could win the next turn yeah i mean you can do like dockside things or other ways to generate mana like it it in in today's day and age it can get scary so that yeah. is a good point Just, Eli. yeah pro tip keep an eye on uh hand size card card counts yeah um or maybe uh i don't like cards like telepathy i think they're kind of miserable but that would uh do a good job of of Making threat assessment easier or harder, if, depending on how you uh, look I, at it. Yeah, I feel like uh, a bit of both. Yeah, a bit of both. <laughs> but you'll know if they've got a dock side, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> um, but yeah, just... Uh, I personally think having getting to build a deck and not having to spend 10 to 12 card slots on a bunch of just ramp cards... Yeah. That can be really fun. Getting to play with more cards is cool. Or, you know, doing ramp in... I think white has access to a lot of... White and red. A lot of really cool ramp... Uh, Things like, for example, my uh, Aurelia deck that I have, it doesn't play any rocks except for Soul Ring. Um, and the way that it, and it does have a lot of ramp in it though, but its ramp is in the form of Curse of Opulence, um, Loyal Warhound, uh, Knight of the White Orchid, and uh, Land Tutors, and Nykthos, and Ancient Tomb. And, you know, it does a pretty good job of having mana, or in like Keeper of the Court, stuff like that. It does a pretty good job of having having mana when it needs to, and 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 having like like big explosive plays. Oh, I, I should mention also the equipment that tutor you for lands too. But mm-hmm. these aren't mana rocks, is the what I'm saying, and it's 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 a different uh, mana rocks or like rampant growth. You know, different different ways to do it. Yeah, it's it's on board value generation. Yeah, and that's something that I think uh, Boros really leans itself into a lot of the time. All right, well, what do you say we move on to um, revisiting? This section is called. Real Boros Weaknesses, Revisited. This was because in January, when we put out our first episode, we ended the episode by talking about um, the weaknesses that we thought that Boros does have. Not the ones that people think they have, the ones that we think they have, right? Yeah, not the things in people's imaginations. So. Not not card draw and uh, and ramp, because they can do that. We proved yeah. that. in the la- It's proven scientifically. <laughs> QED. With our facts and logic. <laughs> um... But what do you say, Eli? We start go through these uh, these five things. Yeah. So uh, as we had it at the start of the year, the first thing we had was uh, a Boros deck might want to play more lands than a blue or green deck because of the uh, the lack of burst card advantage or land tutoring effects. Yeah. So I don't really know. I mean, the one that has gotten a little bit better since then because we did like I think that like we said earlier that uh, that farmer farm guy. Um, is a very playable card, and if you have a card like Land Tax or a two drop that puts a planes into your hand, um, there's arguments that that can ap- start to approach to replace a land in your deck. Probably not exactly that, but it gets into that territory. I've actually cut out two lands from my mono white deck since the start of the year because I've just been putting more and more card advantage and land tutoring cards yeah. into that deck, and it kind of it makes up for that. Mm-hmm. But when he says cut two lands, he's saying forty to thirty-eight. He played a lot of lands. I played think. a lot of lands. Well, two, th- two of them were kind of like not really lands. Like Kelder and Outpost need to sacrifice a land, and I had one other that's kind of a lot of utility shifty. lands and a lot of lands in that one. Just yeah. to, he's not going down to thirty-three guys. No, okay? no, no don't no. do that. Yeah. Um. But uh, yeah, I don't know that that that's one of the things that I suppose still still reigns true. I think a little bit. I mean. We, we we're getting we're getting there. Um, oh, and also I, I should mention looting effects make make it much better to you you don't you you know I, it's interesting because it's like a two edged sword because if you have a lot of looting effects that means you can play less lands because you can get the lands you need to but it also means you can play more lands because you won't get flooded with the lands because you can loot them away <laughs> so it's it's interesting. So yeah, the message there is play Plarg as your commander and you will never have problems. Yeah, exactly. Play 40, never get, 38, never get flooded, 40 never screwed. Lands. Yeah, perfect. Um, okay, well, the second thing was free interaction. When we, uh, last year, I think we only had, um, the best ones being, like, deflecting SWAT and flawless man- maneuver, and I guess you had, like, the, the things that, like, destroyed artifacts or something by, like... Yeah, abolish, uh... Stuff like that. Nothing amazing, really. Yeah. I think that Solitude might be... One of the best pieces of free interaction, like... In the game. N- nothing touches uh, Deflecting Swat, in my opinion. Yeah. I think that's probably one of the best red cards in Commander. Sure. 
Um, but you know, Solitude, great addition. So I, I do like that uh, that improvement we've got in that way. Solitude is especially amazing, or like uh, also Fury, I guess, because they're free interaction when you really need it. But if you don't, if you're not hurting for free interaction that you really need to like stay alive in that game, yeah, you you cast them and then maybe flicker them, and then they're actually they're like two for ones. Yeah. So either you you're kind of like you're either two for one in yourself if you play them for free because you need to exile the card from your hand or you wait until later and then it's card advantage for you yeah man and i love that i the thing i like about solitude is that um the way that i i view it is it's a five mana flash creature with an etb that has a removal spell on it pretty good i'd say playing a solitude feels good but it's also a safety valve where if something goes really wrong if someone is threatening to win you can just play it for free that's how i view it most of the time Mm-hmm. So and that and that's that sort of uh that safety valve is really important and it's really nice. Well, and even then, it's it's in your graveyard for later. So if you have yeah. like some creature recursion, get it back to your hand. Get it back. That's to really the field. good. Yeah. Um. So good there. Um. The next one is that you don't have. I'll, I'll quote this. Like, you, go ahead. What were you gonna say? Oh yeah, it's a little it's a little janky on there, but yeah, single card finishers. Sure. In Boros, like in other colors, you have cards like. Uh, you know, like Omniscience, Rise of the Dark Realms, Expropriate, stuff like that. And in Boros, you don't really have many good one-card finishers. Mm-hmm. I think we got one that you could argue is kind of a one-card finisher yeah, with enough crack, mana. Crackle with power. Yeah. But overall, I still think that is still maybe a problem that Boros has. Yeah, and that's a lot of mana, but... Yeah, it's a... Uh... And, you know, I think that is actually a good problem, because I personally... I'm fine with most of these cards existing. I don't think they're very healthy for the format. Yeah, maybe I don't want a Boros card that says, you know, seven mana, um, return all creatures from your graveyard to the battlefield, attacking, and you get an extra combat. I don't think I'd want that. That's probably not good. Yeah, like we were talking about earlier, I mentioned with, with all the fast mana and stuff that exists, somebody could just win off of, like, no board state. I think if you play with somebody who you know has one of these cards in their deck... You just always have to assess them as a little bit of a of a higher threat. We we kind of talked about this on the uh, the hunt episode. Yeah, and I don't think that's always necessarily very fun to play around. Yeah, because if you know that somebody can win from their hand, it it's not always a great time, right? Yeah, and I think it's really not fun for that person too to be like, oh, I don't have anything. It's like, well, you have you omniscience could, in your deck. You could draw a card and win the game on the spot. That's the scary part, right? Yeah. And that's another reason why cards like Solitude are really nice, because you don't have to just kill that person if you have a way to interact with them for free without holding your mana up. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Um, we didn't have... Uh, I think White and Red had less tutors um, as one of our thing, our next thing. And I think we got a couple good ones this year, which is nice. We got the, uh, the uh, class card. Um, yeah, the fighter class. Fighter class. We got the uh, snow tutor. Which is kind of uh, cool. Search for Glory, I think? I think Search for Glory, yeah. Yeah, from Kaldheim. Um, legendary. Am I forgetting anything? Probably am. think forgetting a tutor or two. But those are those are pretty pretty permissible. Like those. Yeah, but also tutors... I don't know. I think, I think it's kind of fun not to play tutors sometimes. When I build a black deck, I have to... You know, I probably should put Demonic Tutor in it, but I find myself not. Because I... Unless I'm trying to, you know, approach a more powerful thing, I think it's better to play with less efficient tutors or you know it just it's just more fun sometimes more variance we have a friend that's very anti-tutor and because you just end up getting the same cards all the time and it makes your your games always feel the same and i think he's on to something like yeah my my tajik deck has almost no tutors it has a land tax and a weather wayfarer and aside from that it's just like you get what you get yeah land tutors are based i don't care what you say um all right, well, our last uh, Boros weakness that we have is that Boros board states tend to be more threatening because you have to play to the board and your like stuff is telegraphed more than other colors a lot of the time. Um, and unless you have haste, you know, you have to usually wait a turn cycle to do your combat things. Mm-hmm. So, um, and then we talked about this earlier a little bit about how some other colors maybe can more often win from the hand. Um, not to say that Boros doesn't have combos. You have those. It's just... Not often the primary game plan. Yeah, aggressive strategies, I think, are kind of inherently at a, at a disadvantage in yeah. Commander. Um, 
I think that Boros might have gotten a little better in this sense because what we've got, like, I mean, they've added a couple more ways to win uh, for less mana. So, for example, you can do the um, the Toralf Blasphemous Act thing from your hand, like if it's not in your command zone. Um, or, you know, just to stay on theme, you know, Halvar or things like that, adding Double Strike can make things more threatening quicker. So, things like that. Yeah, good good ways to facilitate a win condition. And also, like we talked about, uh, Mia and that Feywild steed as giving not really protection, but like ke- keeping up your... Uh, Defenses? Or your, your card advantage, advantage like if, if you do get picked apart by spot removal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're not just totally blown out. Yeah, and like let's say you are like have like that, that face suit out and like you have a board and you're holding up like a protection spell. Like if somebody like targets your thing... You can just let it go, or you can protect your stuff, and you still have to get the card. But then, yeah, speaking of that, we we did get two more really efficient creature protection spells. So that is the a Guardian nice of thing. Faith and the Glorious Protector. And we also got the uh, not 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 Psychrift protection, but we got the um, the Fortel one uh, as well. That when the, your cards that go to the yeah, graveyard cosmic come back, intervention, and that can trigger your uh, abilities again, right? Same with the Glorious Protector. Yeah, lots your ETB abilities. lots of good stuff. So I I feel like. Uh, that's getting okay. You just have to play it a little, uh, a little cautiously, yeah. maybe. You gotta think about things. Don't always just like you know tap out, just, fold the board. Yeah, don't overextend, but you know, sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. But honestly, like, like I, I talked about that game I played at the game shop earlier. Um, sometimes you could be in that position where you overextend a little bit and get board wiped, and you're still just you're... fine because the the card advantage is good. Oh yeah, man. Like, uh, like let's say like. You're, you're play like a Boros curve out game, right? And you play like a Sun Titan or something, right? And then you're like, oh my god, it's epic! I got all this stuff on the board. You get board wiped, and then you play uh, you play the the back half of Mia from your hand. Like you got two cards in your hand. One of them is Mia, and then you reanimate the Sun Titan, get another thing back. Uh, maybe it's a Curse Mirror, Curse Mirror of the Sun Titan. You know, oh my god, get yeah. another thing back. You can rebuild. You can rebuild faster now in Boros. I think that's one thing. Yep. You can rebuild well, so that's nice. But yeah, I think uh, the weaknesses they're they're still there. Yeah, it's that's a little good. Bit better. That's good. They should you have. You gotta have weakness. Yeah. Yeah. But do you want to go into our uh, our top ten cards? Yeah. So this is gonna be fun because I want people to be mad first of all because I love it when people are mad at me and I want to say to preface these are our genuine opinions. It's not specifically to be spicy. So if you think that, you know, please believe us. Um, I mentioned earlier in the episode there were 580 new cards. Uh, we're going to try to narrow that down to the top 10. So, yeah, to preface this, um, just because something's not on this list does not mean we think it's a bad card. Or because it's lower on the list, it doesn't mean we think it's a bad card. They're all good cards. There are so many good Boros cards that came yeah. out this year that the number 10, number 9, number 8 slots you know, maybe could have been number 1 a different year. Yeah, these are just uh, there, there's a lot of good stuff. So uh, we just put what this was. Uh, this was a tough list to make. Yeah. So uh, hold your hold your horses, hold your britches. Mm-hmm. So we have our top ten red and or white cards from 2021 for Boros decks, and we're gonna get right into it with number ten. We have Archaeomancer's Map from the Strixhaven Commander deck, the yeah. Lorehold one. <laughs> or hold legacies. And this is why I was uh, prefacing uh, all this with uh, so many good cards came out. Because I think this one might shock a lot of listeners. It's only number 10. It's a lot of good cards. Hey, it's it's on the list. Like, top 10. This this is a big thing. This is a good card. Um, I only have it in one deck right now. It's my Bruce and Elena partners deck. That's kind of a kind of an artifact theme deck. Kind of just a big creatures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I like this card a lot. It's uh, it's a good three drop. It uh, gets you the two basic planes in your hand, and then sometimes, uh, pretty often, it, it ramps to at least one. Land. Yeah. Um, the, I think the one of the big arguments, uh, if we had to make an argument against it being higher on the list, um, when you compare it to other cards like Keeper of the Accord, um, when when you do get the uh, the trigger on Keeper of the Accord, it gets a land from your deck, whereas with Arcam Answers Map. Um, you know, if you're missing your land drops, Keeper of the Accord catches you back up. Whereas if you're missing your land drops with Archaeomancer's map, you know, you, you you don't have any lands in your hand to put into play. So that's one point against it, right? Well, it, it at least gets you the, the, the gets first you, two. It always initially. gets you the two, which is so very nice. So it gets nice. you two for sure. 
So that's why I like it a lot. I've heard a lot of people compare it to Cultivate. Yeah. And I think that's a pretty apt comparison. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it can only get planes, which is maybe a downside. Yeah. But it's also an artifact, so it's you can sacrifice it to stuff. You can recur it. Yeah, that is so nice. it's so I think it's better than Cultivate, honestly. Yeah, um, it's 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 a different it's different, right? Because like Cultivate gets you the one in play right away, whereas right. Archaeomancer's yeah. map might not. It's it's less consistent than Cultivate, but I think it's got kind of a. Kind of a higher ceiling, because if you do end up with a bunch of lands in your hand, or if you're, like, yeah. drawing a lot of cards, but not necessarily ramping ahead with lands, or you're doing tricky stuff with, like, bounce lands, or sacrificing lands, you could put out a bunch of extra lands, because it just triggers when an opponent puts a land into play, if, yeah. if, if that opponent has more lands than you. So if they ramp multiple times in a turn, you could get multiple Archaeomancer's map triggers in a turn. And it's all, of course, it's obviously better against decks that play land ramp themselves. So sometimes it can be a bit uh, conditional on what you're playing against. Because sometimes, you know, if they're, if a deck's playing a Burner Shutter or something, it's going to be better for you, right? Or if you're going last, it's going to be better for you than if you're going first. Um, but it, like you said, Eli, it is really nice that it's an artifact as opposed to a sorcery because that means it can be blinked. I know we got uh, teleportation circle this year as a way to blink artifacts. Oh yeah, it's artifacts too, doesn't it? Yeah, creatures are artifacts, so it's kind of interesting. Yeah, you can rummage it away, get it back with Sun Titan. Yeah, uh, cool pass, stuff you can do with it. Passes the Sun Titan test. Yeah, passes the Sun Titan test. Um, up next, uh, this one this might be controversial, especially being above. Uh, Archaeomancer's map, but I put a or we put fighter class, which is the uh, the two mana the the what do they call them sagas? Uh, no, they are. Uh, um, oh, this is it's, it's a new. Uh, sorry, this these are the class cards. They're just enchantments. Yeah, they're just cla- enchantments, and they're 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 classes. They're, they're, I think they're just type enchantment. Yeah, because they're they're different than sagas. Because sagas tick up naturally. You have to pay to put it up to the next yep. level. So um, the important part about this is that it is an equipment tutor. That is a permanent and can have more value if you level it up. Or, you know, like we were saying about um, Archaeomancer's map, it could be blinked or recurred, right? So that's a nice thing. Yeah, and uh, one of our favorite cards is Stoneforge Mystic. Yeah. And this this is not a Stoneforge Mystic, but it's a lot cheaper than that in monetary value. Yeah. And it also gives you the other side. Like, I feel like the best creature pairing in an equipment deck is Stoneforge Mystic and Pure Steel Paladin. Yeah. This kind of gets you both... Ha- it gets you a tutor for an equipment, and then it can, on its second mode for three mana, makes your equip costs not free, but it makes them cost uh, two less to equip, which could be down to zero. So if you have your Sword of X and Ys, They're all those are two. zero to equip. Your Sword of the Animus is, uh, yeah, as well for... It's free as well. Um, another thing is uh, it goes well with... Um, what is the uh, the equipment that makes copies of itself when you hit somebody? Um Oh yeah, the the bloodthirsty uh, bloodthirsty battle axe. Yeah. So if you if you want to pair it with something like that, you know you can make them all free to equip. Um, technically, it does the thing with blood tokens for that new blood token card. It's probably not a good uh, way to <laughs> probably not the best uh, reason to play it. But the nice thing about it is, it's pretty much either the second or third or fourth best equipment tutor out of like seven or eight of them. Yeah, um, and Steel Shaper's Gift, while it is just one white mana as opposed to this is Boros, Steel Shaper's Gift is very expensive right now. Yeah. And like you said, it's not a permanent, so like we said, passes the Sun Titan test. Yeah, that's so that's such big game, honestly. Um and also, you know, you can it's it's probably like just like straight up better than open the armory. Oh um, yeah, I by like I, a lot better. Yeah, I I think strictly better. Well, it doesn't get auras, but but that's what I was thinking. But most of the time, you don't want auras to open the armory. I definitely right? I pulled out open the armory for fighter class in my Voltron deck. So. Yeah, um, and then every once in a while, you'll level it up to the third the third level and get the uh, forced blocks through if you want. Yeah, and that's that's, that's cool too, right? Yeah, but really good card, love it. And up next, we have Vanquish the Horde, and again, this one maybe people think it should be higher. It's obviously very good. We just put it so low because. While it is perhaps the new most efficient white board wipe, it is just a board wipe. It's nothing very exciting or new. But yeah, it, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't. You know, it's not the cornerstone of a deck. It doesn't uh, do anything that other cards didn't do. Um, you know, uh, spoiler: we don't have Doom Scar on this list. That was also a very good board wipe we got this year. 
But, you know, when when you have such great one as Vanquish the Horde, that can't really fit. Yeah, but if you're going to have all these commander players coming out and be like, oh, white isn't even the color of removal anymore. When's the last time we had a good board wipe and for commanders? Like, Vanquish yeah. the Horde. Shut the fuck up. Yeah, it's the the best best or second best board wipe yeah. uh, we've had in years. Yeah, shut up forever. <laughs> um, so now in Boros, we got Vanquish the Horde and Blasphemous Act. <laughs> kind of based. Yeah. Um, and not too much to talk about this one. Oh, I guess I could mention a couple things. Um... The nice thing about having a very cheap board wipe like Vanquish the Horde is that you can pair it with your protection spells on the same turn. So you can mm-hmm. do the protect all my stuff with like a Righteous Protector, um, and then board wipe, and then it kills everything, kills the Righteous Protector, you get all your things back, get all the ETBs, everything like that. Or, you know, one of the other three or four effects they printed this year to do that. Yeah, and I also, personally, this is a bit more narrow, but... I love the card Sunburn, Sunbird's Invocation and uh, oh, Combustible Gear Hulk. Yeah. So it's really cool with those to have a card that is... Its CMC is a lot higher than what you actually pay for it. Yeah, so for the for the CMC Matters effects. Yeah, makes sense. All right, number seven. We have Mia, Crafty Companion, slash Luca, Wayward Bonder. Um, this card just... I mean, you might disagree with it being higher than the previous three cards, but... It's. I think it earns the spot because just because of the three R's of Boros thing, Luca just epitomizes everything that Boros does. I honestly, well, me and Luca at least. This card, like in its entirety, will maybe not as it'll fit in any any Boros deck, any deck, literally any Boros deck could play me and Luca, and it would be good. That's mm-hmm. the thing that I think is so powerful about this card. Um, if you're like a creature deck, you play the front half and protect your your quote unquote protect your stuff. If you're, you know, if you're more of a um, control deck or even just a creature deck that makes it turn six before drawing it, you play Luca, rummage away a creature, draw two cards, or maybe reanimate something. It's just a great card. I have uh, many different Boros decks, as everyone who's listened to the show probably knows, and uh, I put this card in, I think, at least four different decks with very different themes. And I also just think if you were going to pick a random commander, I think this was the commander for the deck... Of just cards from this year, right? Yes. If you just wanted, like, I want a Boros good stuff deck, I think uh, I think Mia Luka could do you very well. Yeah, I agree. So yeah, maybe uh, maybe it shouldn't be so high, but I just I love this card a lot. I think, um, like you said, the the three R's being on a card that that means a lot, and it's really cool, and just fits two slots on your curve. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of good stuff. Yeah, it's awesome. All right, the next card, number six, we have. Ardent Elementalist. Um, very unassuming card, I would say. Not uh, not a card that you might think of. You know, it's a common. You know, why would it be on the top ten list? But, man, the amount of crazy things you can do with this card is... I don't know. It's In blue, right, you, you get back uh, extra turn spell. Like, that's the gross thing. In red, you get back a Wheel of Fortune or Jessica's Will. Right? Like, those are good things. Yeah, I, I feel like anyone who maybe doubts this placing if you've played against an archaeomancer or like uh like eternal witness getting back spells this uh not well it's not an eternal witness definitely but no but it's uh, that effect is is very important i think and, and lends to some really interesting and cool things you can do like like uh i think i kind of accidentally invented a new like infinite mana combo in my my gerard deck with this and uh just getting like a bunch of mana positive rocks and then uh the card leave the chance yeah just bounce this back play play out your rocks again like float more mana and then just keep repeating that process yeah with an, and especially if you have like a sneak attack and play you can put it into play for one mana get back your leave the chance bounce your rocks play them again yeah so there's a lot of cool stuff you can do with this effect and i think uh just it's a really new thing and uh Glad to have it. Yeah, good to have it at that mana value, too. All right, number five, we have... Uh, we know When we talked about number seven, Mia and Luca, we were talking about how this was a good legendary creature you play as a commander for just, like, a good stuff Boros deck. I think this next card probably is the same concept. It is Plarg, Dean of Chaos, and Augusta, Dean of Order. Plarg is the man. This is He, he is my little dude. Um, literally everything I want... It uh, facilitates your Boros um, kind of loot game plan. It makes your it turns your um, 
your land taxes and effects like that into card advantage because it lets you loot away the, the, the lands and get into real cards. Um, it has card advantage on itself with its with its uh, five mana ability to tap and do things, and it just comes out like immediately in the game. It's all you can have. You can play a deck with like no two drops if you want in a Plark deck because you just never you just play Plark on two every time. Yeah, and that's not even to mention all the stuff that you you could build around the Augusta side. Like, yeah, I think uh, I think PJ the War Leader mm-hmm. built a deck based around like untap effects and stuff like that with with Augusta. Yeah. And just having Plarg as the backside of that to like get your early game going until you have all your, your other stuff. stuff set up. Oh my god, it's so good. He's really good. He's You'll... just uh, he also could be just a really good Boros good stuff commander. Yep, yep. Um, you want to introduce number four, Eli? Yeah, this is uh. So I've I've seen a lot of people kind of down on the the cursed mirror, but we got number four. We got cursed mirror, and I've never seen it be not good or not very good. Not very good. Yes. So, um, the thing with Cursed Mirror is that it really, it's, it's, it fits this category of cards that, that fill more than one purpose in the game, right? Cursed Mirror is your value piece. It's your finisher. It's just a ramp card. It does everything you want to do pretty much any time you're ever going to play it. And that's why it's so good. And this is perhaps the uh, best at passing the, the Sun, Sun Titan, Titan test, test. yes. Because if you play a sun titan and target curse mirror it comes back it becomes a sun titan with haste and it returns another thing and then you attack with your curse mirror sun titan and get a fourth thing it gets back another third thing. thing and then you can also tap it for a red mana after that because it has vigilance <laughs> um so it's it's just insane like i something i was always envious of in blue decks was the uh card phantasmal image being a two mana clone even just like Two mana get an ETB ability is sometimes very powerful. So for three mana being able to do that, and then also having haste right away, even if it doesn't stay as the creature, I think it's super strong. Like, like just imagine this for me for a second. Imagine you play any two drop creature um, in a Boros deck that you would play that generates value or something. So maybe a um, maybe a uh, audacious farmhand, which tr- puts a planes in your hand, or a stoneforge mystic, which gets an equipment. And then you follow that up on your curve with your ramp, your, your mana rock that also gets you another one of those things. Like that's the worst case scenario is like three mana mana rock that draws a card. Like I think I think if Commander Sphere was front loaded and drew a card when it entered the battlefield, it'd be a very good card, right? Yeah, I and think that's like the worst scenario for Cursed Mirror. The best scenario is like you play it. Um, and you get like an even better, e- even better ETB effect, or maybe you copy like a Razaketh or something on the other side of the board, or some other like big like like drag like an Ur-, Ur Dragon or something. Then you attack and draw a card for attack for ten. It, it's just a really really good card at every stage of the game. Yeah, it's crazy. The what's the four mana sorcery that you got me turned on to? Uh, Mirage, Mirage, uh, hate Mirage, hate Mirage, yes. Yeah, that card's really good. I I think Curse Mirror. It's it's like that, but it's it's, exactly it's like better. That. It's a permanent. It's, yeah, it's a permanent, and it sticks around and is a mana rock. So love that card. Also, blinkable, like we talked talked about earlier. Yep. So awesome. All right, number three, we have an effect that we didn't have very much in Boros before. Um, was Tybalt's Trickery. And I think the real reason that Tibble's Trickery has to be this high up on the list is just because it's kind of a game changer, honestly. It's, like, so versatile. It's crazy how you can just print Counterspell in another color and have it be, like, one of the best cards printed. Yeah, Counterspell with Downside. Yeah. We talked about on the episode Blue Needs to be Stopped just how strong Counterspells are. And having Counterspells in your Boros deck, it's just... It's like we were talking about ways to protect yourself from certain kinds of board wipes. Yeah. Not only does it do that, but it also gives you the ability to really have have ways to interact with certain card types or certain effects that you wouldn't have had before. Yeah. Like if somebody plays their Torment of Hailfire on you, like for like, X how do you, equals like how 20. How do you not die? It's fairy protection, like that's it, right? Yeah. So um, having something like this is just... Oh wait, uh, does that even work against Torment of, Torment of Hailfire? Because you pay life, right? Or is, your life total can't change? I think your life total can't okay, change. Okay, okay, never mind. Sorry. Um, but yeah, you're definitely right in that case. And the interesting thing with Tibble's Trickery is its downside, in a very slim scenario, could also be an upside. Because I, I, will not, I will not lie to you. I have 
Tor- t- uh, Tybalt's trickery in my own spells when I have, like, nothing going on and I need to try to, like, dig for something, right? Like, dig for a board wipe or dig for some value piece. You play your one-drop creature, your, your whatever, and you play your Tybalt's trickery on it and hope to get something. Like, it sometimes... Like, when you Chaos Orp your own things, it happens sometimes. Yeah. But, like you said, Eli, the most powerful thing that it does is definitely the versatility of being able to protect your plays as well as to stop your opponent's plays i do kind of like that maybe in that scenario um you play something good but like not amazing or like you don't think it's amazing and somebody else just randomly decides to counter Counter spell it it. and then you step in and counter spell your own thing yeah like like it's something better maybe turn it into something else because like you're like it's already going downhill or maybe someone yeah yeah i like that i like that concept um all right number two eli what do we got Number two, we have, we've talked about it a lot on this episode, but Solitude. Just uh, not a lot to say about Solitude. It's just, it's good. It's, ah, man. It, it would be the best card printed in many other years. But the next card is just so good. But, man, Solitude, we talked about it a lot. You know, it just, same, same with Tybalt's Trickery. It lets you uh, interact in different ways. Having that free interaction. The ability to tap out in a Boros deck is really nice. Again, if if somebody's going to say that, that White hasn't gotten good removal for Commander this year, it's, no, Solitude just... Yeah. It's, it ends the argument. Like, it's second Swords to Plowshares. Yeah, honestly. Um, the only downside is that it's 40 or $50. Yeah. Honestly. Um, but uh, just moving on to, to get things out of the way, like, there's no secret. Um, number one, it's got to be Esper Sentinel. Best card printed in... The best white card printed since Teferi's Protection. That's what I'm going to say, right? Yeah, uh, during Modern Horizons 2 spoiler season, I remember halfway through it, I was, wasn't seeing anything that special, and then all of a sudden, Esper Sentinel gets spoiled, and it's like, this is maybe the best white card I've seen since uh, like Smothering Tithe. Smothering Tithe, yeah. Teferi's Protection, one of those, probably. Um, I, I think it. there's a good argument for it being better than, uh, you know, a lot of other... Uh, you know, I think, obviously, we think it's better than all the cards released this year. Probably better than, um, oh, what is it? <laughs> Keeper of the Accord. Um, yeah. I mean, you could. we're not here to split hairs about what's better or not, but Esper Sentinel just, uh, the fact that it's a one-drop makes it powerful in so many different ways. The most obvious of which is, you know, playing it on turn one. That's the most obvious, like, best-case scenario. But also, I mentioned earlier that White has several ways to tutor one-drops to your hand. Mm-hmm. And... Esper Sentinel is 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 uh is so good that I was considering when I was building the only Boros cards twenty twenty one deck that I was building I was considering playing, um, uh what's the the land that uh sorry what, the land that gets uh, artifacts Urza Saga I was considering playing Urza Saga in the deck with the only target being Esper Sentinel just to get that out because it's that powerful. And like I mentioned earlier, anything that's skull clampable gets immediately better. <laughs> So when your Esper Sentinel's not not doing too hot and you have a Skull Clamp, trade it away. I think I put Esper Sentinel in almost every Boros deck I have. I put it in my Mono White deck. And even decks that don't have any way to increase its power, because that's the the main thing I've seen people say is like, oh, you know, you gotta really pump up its power to make it good. And I, I think, well It is good, but if you play it on turn one and you're able to draw two cards off of it. Mm-hmm. That's a really good card. And even if you play it late game, I mean, like, the tax effect matters. Like, it will do something um, to your opponents. And also, like I said, it can get clamped away. Or, you know, maybe you have a sword lying around. You can put it on the Esper Sentinel. And now they have to pay three, right? Like, that that's big game. That's probably not getting paid. Yeah. So I think it might be... Like, I don't say this very lightly, but as far as, like, does this go in every white deck... I don't think you'd ever be wrong to put it in a white deck. Yeah, I'll say that much. I think um, I've seen it a couple times on game nights now in decks that weren't even like mono white or Boros. Like like a yeah, they played it in like a Selesnya deck mm-hmm. and it drew like five cards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That so, was yeah, that was crazy. So Esper Sentinel, big big Papa, big man at home. Um, unfortunately, it's around seventeen, eighteen dollars right now, so a bit pricey. But not in the range of un unbuyable. You can still get it if you want to. Yeah, trade up for one of those and then just proxy it in a bunch of decks. Yeah. Um. One. I wish we did an episode about uh, 
better than Soul Ring. It was one of our first episodes we did, and we talked about one drop creatures that were sometimes better to play on turn one than Soul Ring. And Esper Sentinel Esper is Esper Sentinel is better than Soul Ring. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on yeah, man, it's a good card. Um, I'm so sad, Spencer. I don't think I've like. I can't remember if I've ever cast an Esper Sentinel since I put it in, in like all my decks. Well, that means you're not playing enough Commander, Eli. No, man. I just, it makes me want to play more. Because I put it in my Tajik deck. Yeah. The Legion's Edge one. You haven't got a chance. And I... that actually, like, increases its power, too. Yeah. God, yeah. So oh, it good. makes it bigger. Uh, I don't think you've played an Esper Sentinel on one or a Ragavan on one in that deck, which is sad. Because those are the dreams. Yeah. Those are the dreams. Um, well, do you want to just say a couple honorable mentions real quick? Yeah, we got some honorable mentions. Uh, the first one, not really a, a Boros card, but it's... Honorary Boros card. Yeah. Sort of Hearth and Home. Maybe the second best sort of X and Y. I yeah. think that's what most people agree would say now. Yeah, um, there's situations where it's the best, but I think maybe, like you were saying, Eli, in, in the average, on average, it's probably second best or so behind Feast and Famine. It's definitely Aurelia's favorite sword. Yeah, oh my god. Not to hold herself, but... You know. No. Well, she, uh, yeah, combos with that. But even if you're not comboing with that, you do get you know two triggers for... Uh, for extra lands and stuff. It's nice. It's so good. Um, we mentioned a bit earlier, uh, Reconstruct History. Um, pretty pretty cool card. Um, I think a lot of people really got hyped when they saw this card because it's like, oh my god, this is the Boros card draw we've been asking for, right? And it's a good card, but it's just not, not nowhere near the top ten is the problem, right? Yeah, I... It might be you might compare it to like we we bigged up Arden Elementalist, and I like that because it's, it's a creature, it's recurrable. This one... It is very good. I actually do play this in a deck, and I've played it a couple times, and it's always been good for me. Yeah. I think just the fact that it's a it's a five for one, right? If yeah. You get, if you get all the things, which is kind of rare. Like, what, that's not going to happen all Artifact, the time. Artifact, Enchantment, Planeswalker, Land. Is that not it? Land, not uh, Land. Artifact, Enchantment, Instant Sorcery, it's planes, Planeswalker. Planeswalker. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Obviously, uh, everyone wants to get a creature, but it'll probably be too good at that point. Yeah, it's, it's already good enough, but yeah, it's just... Uh, a little bit difficult to get all the things. You also don't need to get them all. You can get two or three things back and be pretty happy. Right. Um, you can get lands back if they're artifact lands. It's nice. But it's a pretty cool card. Just uh... Maybe around the 25, top 25 Boros cards. Yeah, maybe. It maybe. Can show up there. I don't know. Um, now we've got Toralf and Halvar, the the two uh, you know cards we talked about before from yeah, the cult. Mythic Boros Gods. Yeah, very good, very good cards, but... Uh, Unfortunately, there's too many other good cards. Yeah, Halvar is a little little niche to just equipment decks, and Toralf is kind of his own own thing too. But yeah. although I th- I think you might be good just playing Toralf in a deck with Blasphemous Sack. I would. I do actually. I have it in my uh, my uh, my red black deck that just has a Blasphemous Sack in it because it's a oops I win card. Yeah. Um, and then uh, yeah. This, a big one that could have been on the top ten list, I think, but uh. I haven't played with it a lot. I just know that it is obviously good. Is Oswald Fiddlebender being kind of a birthing pod for artifacts? Yeah, very strong card. I I could definitely see an argument for that being on the top ten list instead of like maybe Fighter Class or Archaeomancer's Map. Yeah, maybe it's just a little bit too um, specific. Um, I guess Fighter yeah. Class also is a bit specific, but I find that maybe more decks want to do the Fighter Class thing than decks want to do the Oswald thing. Yeah, because while it is a uh, Pretty good tutor if, like, you maybe sacrifice your, uh, like, an artifact land, get a one drop. Not every deck's playing an artifact land or zero mana artifacts. I guess you could sack a token to it. Yeah, maybe you pl- sack, um, like, a clue or something, and you get you get your soul ring or something, or your Esper Sentinel. Yeah, but then you, if you really want to take, like, full advantage of him, you go from, you kind of have to have, like, a, a curve Big, to it. You have to have, like, like bigger artifacts, right? Yeah, I tried playing him for a little bit in my Bruce Elena kind of artifact deck, but it's not... It has good artifacts to get. Like, I could sacrifice an artifact land and get a Skull Clamp or Soul Ring. But I didn't have a lot to get in the middle of the curve. Mm-hmm. So I ended up cutting them out. But there's certainly decks you can build around this card. Or, you know, build with it in mind. And it'll be very powerful. Yeah. Um, I think you have... Uh, oh, what We didn't mention this uh, at all in this episode. And it's not on the honorable mentions list. But I think Audacious Reshapers is kind of a cool card that kind of fits that idea. Of the same kind of concept. Yeah, I love that card. Um, but our last card here, uh, on our honorable mentions list is Redain, God of the Worthy, slash Valkmira, Protector's Shield. And we talked about this earlier in this episode, but Redain is just a house. Um, it's, uh, it's light taxing. Um, I like that it doesn't just stop people from doing things, but, uh, 
It does uh, stop things that are very scary, like board wipes. <laughs> yeah, I... spells in Commander that are four mana or more. If people are playing those, they're they're always really good. Yeah. So putting the the two extra mana onto that into your extra turn spell or your exsanguinate or yeah. your or your um uh what uh, greater good or something right. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing that's nice about Redain that I think is often understated about it is that it has Vigilance and Flying. So it is a very good sword holder because it gets in and it stays on defense. Love Vigilance in uh, Equipment Decks. Yeah, she's really good. Yeah, very big fan. And also, you can hate on people that play Snowlands. It's the reason. <laughs> um, it does. If, if your opponent is playing a Snow Basics deck, it is very miserable to be against a uh, Redain. Mm-hmm. So yeah, those are our honorable mentions. Um, let's say we move into our last section here, Eli. Yeah, looking to the future for 2022, what do we want to see as far as red and white? Well, I think, Eli, you know, you and I definitely think that Boros did very well this year. So, to some extent, more of the same, right? Yeah. Maybe even less of the same. Maybe a little less, yeah. Because there's a lot of cards that came out this year. We made a whole goddamn deck out of just good cards from this year. Yeah. So, more of the same would be great. Um... I think you talked about earlier, Eli, in this episode about how Boros cards can be a bit pricey. Some of the best ones, like, you know, Solitude, of course, is one of our, as our number two card, is uh, $450. And a lot of the older white cards are also expensive. Oh, yeah, that's, uh, I guess what I want to say is, uh, don't give us new good Boros cards. Just just reprint the old ones you made this year. Just yeah. do the same year again. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe reprint Fairy Spection two or three more times, you know? Yeah. Um, so... Keep make maybe I mean we've had a lot of good commons and uncommons this year. More, I'd like more. That'd be nice. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then Eli, what is the most important thing we want to see looking to the future about Boros? Oh yeah, we uh we want to see something die. We want to we want the death of the meme. Death of the Boros slash mono white meme. It's got to go away. It's got to stop. One of these days. People have got to stop doing this. It's not funny anymore. It's not, maybe it was a little bit funny a while ago. Like, I just want people to know, like, back in the day, like, this is how you create monsters. Like, this is how you make supervillains. Like, by just the constant bullying and the mockery. Like, this is, like, that's when I used to be, like, real edgy and be like, oh, man, like, I want to, like, prove, like, how, how smart I am and, like, how cool I am. I was like, I'm going to make a bunch of Boros decks and then they'll be good and, like, I'll get people. And that's... That's how you. That's how you create war leaders, though. That's yeah. how PJ was made. You know what they say, Eli? Uh, uh, hard times create strong men. <laughs> strong men create weak times. Weak times create. But what what you're doing though is you're creating people like that who are, who make like very strong to like competitive Boros decks and just decide they want to like pub stomp people to prove a point, and that is not a good thing. Yeah. Because like I feel like there are people and like maybe I'd. Maybe I'd have to cave into the temptation too if I like saw like Dana or Joey or something and be like, "Hey guys, you want to play? Some you want to play some Commander?" And you'd be like, "Want to see my new Boros deck?" Yeah, but no. The problem is that Boros has been the butt of the joke for years and years now. And anyone whose favorite color combination or favorite thing is the butt of the joke for a long period of time is gonna have is gonna develop some sort of resentment or at least frustration, right? So I don't know, man. It's just uh. Try to have, you know, try to have some sympathy, some empathy, maybe, for Boros players. And maybe before you, uh, before you kind of uh, start going along with the meme, maybe take a nice critical look at whether the thing you're saying is actually true or not. And not just being like, well, this is the trendy thing to say. That's what one thing that I don't like. Right. I, I, I certainly don't want people to feel discouraged to play what they want to play in Commander. Yeah. Um, you know, we all, we're, we're uh, you know, we'll, we'll be often talking about how good Simic is and how it, like, needs to be stopped kind of thing. But I think that's a bit different because, that, for one, that's punching up. And another thing, punching up meaning, like, it's, you yeah. know. Another thing is we're, we're criticizing it and discussing it for being good, not for being bad. <laughs> so, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a big difference there. Um, but I think, you know, Eli, unless you have something else you want to mention, I think that's about what we got, right? Yeah, just it's been a it's been a really good year. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm excited to see what the future holds. I mean, we're certainly getting 
really good white cards all the time, and white being my favorite color, and Boros being my favorite color combination, I'm it's it's just good times. Good times, man. And I yeah. hope to play more Commander because it's a bit funny, but I played more Commander in 2020 versus 2021, which is a bit surprising because 2020 was the lockdown year. <laughs> Um, so yeah. maybe try to, I'm going to try to play more commander next year. Yeah, me too. I need to go on and up, update my magic online decks. Yeah. I actually, uh, a little bit of a tangent, but I saw something about how they're going to revamp magic online soon. They're going to put more resources into it. So. Really? Oh, exciting. Yeah. I, was, I saw that in the, the PJ discord. They were talking about that. There was an article. And so that's, uh, that's pretty exciting. Mm-hmm. Big if true. Big if true. But you know how magic online be. So yeah, we'll see. <laughs> All right, well, uh, you know, follow the Twitter, subscribe, all that stuff. Yep, follow us at uh, EDH Takes. We've been uh, tweeting a little bit more, and uh, we're gonna we're looking forward to a uh, new year of content. Twenty twenty two is the year of EDH Takes. Yeah, please comment and let us know what your favorite Boros card from twenty twenty one was, mm-hmm. and we will see you next year. <laughs>